Hello, I'm Daria Lamb joining you from New York today, and I'm excited to welcome you to an opportunity to learn from practitioners. The theme of this session is making foresight urgent, and um, you're going to have a chance to meet two wonderful practitioners who have taken on the challenge of what do you do when you want to have people take action on foresight, but you're not the boss, you're not the CEO, the chief of staff, the executive director, um, and what are the possibilities for engaging people to start thinking about the future, engaging with the future. And in this case, uh, both of our guests actually have substantial pieces of foresight they wanna share with people and get people to engage with and take action. So you're gonna meet two fabulous uh, members of, of, of the foresight community out in the wild, one from Costa Rica and one from Washington, DC. So let me start with just introducing Kara. Kara Kunzman, who uh, works for aerospace.org. And uh, Kara, why don't you just come and say hello and tell us a little bit about your role, and then we'll get into your project work later. But first, just nice to see you. Great to have you here. Yeah, nice to see you too. And thanks everybody for, for having me. It's just such, it's been such an incredible journey here the last few days. And really kudos to IFTF for making such an interactive event. I've had a lot of fun in some of the, the social <laughs> settings and of course the, the kits that you guys have sent are just really fun and amazing. And they've really got me thinking in a variety of ways and pulling on that, those future, uh, you know, mindset. Um, yeah, so just a bit of a background about myself. So um, I'm our lead futurist here at the Center for Space Policy and Strategy at the Aerospace Corporation. And really my whole focus is on uh, trying to make the space enterprise um, move forward with an abundant mindset, a futures mindset, um, so that we really can bring uh, security, prosperity, um, and abundance to the space enterprise. And so, um, and as, what do you as, define the space enterprise as? Oh, I mean, pretty much anything that touches space is um, impacted by space and goes to space. So, um, whether, and, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but whether you know it or not, I mean, if you eat food, <laughs> if you have electricity, um, if, you know, everything really is connected to space. And um, it impacts all of our lives. It enables a lot of immense uh, capability in our lives that we take for granted. Um, and there's just such an abundant future that many of us are not thinking about. So I'm really excited to kind of walk through that today. Great, okay. Well, we're gonna swap to Paola now. Um, I'd like to introduce Paola Bolgarelli. And uh, she's joining us today from Costa Rica. And uh, Paola, uh, I, I would love to hear first just a little bit about your role. Um, what do you do in Costa Rica? What's the urgent mission in Costa Rica? And then we'll spend a couple of minutes together hearing about the project that you're using to try to make people understand urgent foresight. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daria and all the IFDF team for, for this opportunity. And yes, for all the different uh, speakers that, that you have been having, it's really nice to feel like we are back to normal having this great event, even though we are virtual. So as Daria says, I'm, I'm from Costa Rica and, and I work as uh, as part of CINDE. And CINDE for us is the investment promotion agency in Costa Rica. So pretty much what we do is to bring companies uh, to create jobs, to make sure that we keep uh, Costa Rica, we keep positioning Costa Rica as a talent place. So I always said that that's like the definition, but for me, I work on transforming lives. I work on uh, changing mindsets. I work with uh, inclusion and technology and education because uh, a country of 5 million people really seeing us as a very innovative and, and different country, we have to be quite mm -hmm. uh, concerned about the future and things like that, but that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And just for the record, Jake Dunnigan, um, the head of uh, IFTF's Governance Futures Lab, he says that 5 million is like the sweet spot for a country. So like Norway, Costa Rica, so enjoy yes. it. So we have a slide here. Tell us a little bit about the challenge that you all were trying to solve with Foresight just about a year ago, right? Yes, actually for us, and, and let's picture a country of uh, 5 million people where, let's say, almost half uh, it's part of the workforce population. And we're a country, like even though we're in Central America, we see ourselves as a, as a big country. Uh, and when we try to promote Costa Rica, we always uh, think Costa Rica is uh, what we call a talent hub in Latin America. It's uh, the place where you want to be, you want to prototype uh, a new product, you want to prototype a new way to see things, we are the place for it. 
So when we think in, in Costa Rica and, and the type of services that we have in Costa Rica, it's what the future holds for us. How do we have to transform ourselves? What, what's the agenda that we have to develop to make sure that uh, even though we're a very small country, when we compare it to our competitors, people would like to have an investment in, in Costa Rica. So um, when you compare Costa Rica, again, with other countries in the region, the main reason why companies will, will bring uh, investment to our country is because of talent. Uh, on the other things, we are a very expensive country for investment. So when we think again on talent, we have to think that we are very on the future, that we are very uh, ahead of what's next for us. So. In Cinde, uh, we are trying to make sure to see Costa Rica as an organization, as a company, as an enterprise, and develop our own talent development strategy. And that involves uh, having discussions, not being a political, having discussions, not being someone from the academia, uh, telling and guiding people on how to use resources, how to invest uh, the budget and different things, not being someone who has a political right. position or someone who is part of the government. Right, right, yeah. And and also is not one of the employers or, right. So you're the perfect example of someone who um, wants to change things. So uh, you all, uh, I love this, this philosophy here of what you all took. Um, yes. You just want to share a little bit with uh, yeah. what you guys decided to do. Yeah, so pretty much what we have been doing is working on, on the transition for Costa Rica to be part of the knowledge economy. What are the services? What are the skills? What are the things that we have to develop locally to keep, again, position in Costa Rica as a place to be? And um, in order for us to do so, there are things that we have been working on, and it's really understanding how the, the, the people in Costa Rica see ourselves. And one of the things that we have done is instead of saying technology or instead of saying education or transportation, what's the future of those sectors? How can we see those sectors uh, creating new, new skills, new products locally? And for us, uh, we have been able to, with uh, the future foresight, we did a lot of workshops. We, br we brought people, teenagers. Uh, I do remember the first workshop with a, a children of a six years old that she was part of a whole design thinking session. Wow. And actually, uh, she told the president because the president uh, joined us at some point and she told like, I'm in a private school. I have access to internet and the things that I'm learning today, it's not something that I'm going to learn in the school. So. Am I going to be ready for the future? Wow. And, and that was a futurist. <laughs> yeah. And actually, it's one of the um, uh, kits that we're using for our video. But uh, for us, really thinking on this transformation is not only uh, do some projects, it's what's like the whole uh, life cycle that we have to follow. Mm -hmm. It's public policy. It's uh, the investment on new things. It's, of course, making sure that it's inclusive. Costa Rica, again, uh, being a very small country, we do have people in the capital, but well, also we also have people in the coast area, and that's where uh, we're facing the, the highest unemployment rate. Right. Yeah, and I was part of this project. This was really fun, so they brought the institute in. Um, <laughs> to think about what does the future of knowledge work look like specifically for Costa Rica. Um, and it was a great team. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Jorge Camacho and, and Sarah Skaversky were really the research leads on this. And, um, and you all were wonderful partners to really help us have opportunities to engage with some of those communities and not just assume that everyone in the country is the same. So, uh, so you all uh, had us produce a vision of what, you know, what are some opportunities in there? Um, and then what are some of the things that you all did? You know, just give me a, a quick sense of how did you decide to actionalize that? And then we'll get to Kara. Yeah, we have been using uh, what we call the three main transformation zones for us that are pretty much linked to our values, our whole strategy as a country. And why we have used that as, as part of the tool that we use to communicate to people. Uh, we have been using that as, as the main resource uh, to make sure that we educate. And when we say that is, how do you tell a teenager that is on the coast area that maybe he's just thinking on, on having fun and, and not really having a, a perspective of what's next for me? How do you tell him that you can actually work on technology or you can actually work on, on science being on the coast area? Because uh, how do you tell someone, for example, that is a, a fisherman that your next role can be within the technology area? So making sure that people understand that, that we have to change a, a mindset. 
Uh, we have adapted the content because, again, when you face uh, uh, the government, when you talk to the Minister of either uh, um, Education or Science and Technology, not being someone from the institution, it's very important that, that they understand there's, there's an opportunity. How do you help them to really uh, generate uh, projects that are uh, that includes future foresight that we understand? There are a lot of things that are just for Costa Rica and, and the report that we developed with you guys was pretty much the, fut uh, the future of the skills and learning in mm -hmm. Costa Rica mm -hmm. and how we have to create new jobs. There are things for us and opportunities uh, for places where we are, again, facing the highest unemployed and we have a bunch of job opportunities for us to create. But how do we start to work on that? Mm -hmm. And I think that the most important one for me has been uh, the use of that report to change the way the budget has been allocated within the government, to change uh, the indicators uh, of the project, making sure that the government now understands uh, that yes, we have to do this. And something not funny, but that I keep thinking, maybe they really read the future, is uh, all the, uh, the um, uh, recommendations we got on the report, we presented this report to the government back in October. And now that we're on the pandemic, all the recommendations are part of our day-to-day -day plan. Right. So we were seeing like the 10-year future, but yeah, then- The quick accelerant of yeah. the pandemic, right? So Made the, the future is just uh, the present for us. And that's how we have been using the information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just, I love hearing about uh, that on the government level, you really focused on like, how are they gonna allocate funds? Uh, and I'm going to hear some more examples from you later, but I do want to also hear from Kara. So Kara, let's introduce your project for a couple of minutes here. And, um, and then we're going to go to conversation and hopefully people will learn from this, put things in the chat at whenever you're inspired. Um, so let's bring Kara into the, into the screen here. And um, Kara, uh, welcome. And uh, hey. tell us a little bit about, now your project's a little different because your team actually produced your own foresight. You, you, uh, yeah. I don't know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, you actually came to IFTF's um, foresight essentials training, and um, and then you like said, okay, I've got to really establish my own practice. We've got to establish our point of view. Uh, I've instituted some real lightweight coaching for you on just helping you ask good questions. I think about what you wanted to tackle, uh, and here you are a year later, having just released a report. But but tell me about how you're using foresight within talking to the largest, you know, aerospace and defense contractors. And as you said, agriculture and satellites and cell phones and, and government, you've got so many different audiences. So tell, tell yeah, I think that that's what makes the challenge so complicated is, is I think like Paula, there's, we have so many stakeholders that we have to resonate with and so many that you, um, you know, you, there has to be some prioritization about what you do. So I like to think in general, you know, I, I wear three hats, you know, one is serving our immediate customer needs. The other is, you know, providing thought leadership and provoking a broader, you know, general audience. And then one is about facing and doing the inner work. And we've, we've been hearing a lot, you know, the last few days about the importance of the inner work. And I, I think that for me is maybe the hardest part, right, uh, is, is getting your own organization uh, to make the changes. And so I, I, I have this quote here because I thought it was really important for us all to just kind of take a step back and realize that the work we are doing is not easy. It's, it's, if you, you know, this, this being a foresight practitioner is not for the face of heart. Mm -hmm. um, this, you know, faint of heart, it's, it's for folks that really are passionate about building a better future and know that maybe the first time, the second time, the third time that they bring these ideas, um, you may not get traction and that's okay. Keep going. Success is about keeping with it, staying strong because you know that what you are doing is making the change for the better. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I also think that, especially in the, the times that we live in, isn't our future worth fighting for? So I like to think that we are really fighting for and against the fierce defenders of the status quo, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and that that really is our role and responsibility. Kara with and her white saber, you know, against seriously. The quo, right? I mean, it feels like that a lot. Um, and on a daily basis, I just recenter myself. I energize myself by 
honestly, wonderful people. I think that is really key is that have a good core of people that you can lean on to share thoughts about how to make a, you know, a good future mm -hmm. and just don't listen to the, you know, don't listen too much. You, you need to listen sometimes, I think, to, to the voices that maybe are opposing, because I think there's ways that you can change your communication, but mm -hmm. don't, don't let the negativity overwhelm you. Okay. Uh, so well, you, to took on, you took on a huge challenge, right? So uh, yeah. to not let the negativity, to fight the status quo, you decided, you and your team decided to produce your own futures map, your very first one. Uh, it's available online. Here's the link to it. It just came out maybe 10 days ago. It was made. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, and I know people are going to download these slides because they love uh, Paola's quote from Socrates and, and your quote too, but they'll also get the link to this there. Uh, but tell us about this project and what you were trying to accomplish and, and some of the fun you had with that. Yeah, so um, uh, we have these programs internally called corporate strategic initiatives, which really are more strategy focused, you know, R&D investment funds, internal R&D. Um, and, and so I was given a pot of money to go prove out uh, the value of foresight for the company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most, most folks would probably try to appease leadership on, on issues that resonate most are with customers. And I think our team did a lot of brainstorming and we recognize that there's a bigger conversation missing across the enterprise. And that is a holistic one. And that is tying it into, um, you know, what is the value of space and why are we going and how do we bring it back home to what it means to be human? Um, so we, I'm very fortunate in that I have an uh, you know, an organization of about 4,000 engineers and scientists that, at, you know, most of them have master's and PhDs. They're extraordinarily smart. They're world-class experts. Well, you, you, by the way, don't still, you, you have an, a master's in? I what do. You, Aero and astro engineering. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's so great to see you've made this transition to futurist. I'm, yeah, it's, it's a little strange of a career path for sure. When you go from a very analytical mm -hmm. focused practice into something that's, that's really is truly an art and a science. And, and I've really appreciated that. Um, but I've been able to leverage, you know, and I think this is another tip for the folks listening, leverage the crowd that you have. And if you don't have them in your organization, go find them, go find those perspectives outside. Uh, so we actually had over 70 world-class experts participate in developing this map, which was a lot of fun, a lot of coordination. Um, we were fortunate enough where a lot of that legwork got done uh, prior to COVID. Um, so mm -hmm. we, we had a series of workshops looking for this, you know, the fringe, scanning the horizon, having some convergence discussions. We came up with over 400 different ideas. Um, and then that translated into our seven core themes, which if you um, go and see our map, you, you can kind of dive into that. Um, and really, we, we actually got to spend a week together with our core team. And that's what made this map is spending a week focusing on how do we communicate the key content that we are seeing. Um, and really out of this, there were, there were, I, I didn't know necessarily what we were going to find at the beginning of this journey, mm -hmm. um, but it got deep. Um, I, I mean, essentially what we found is a lot of other discussions I think that we're having, you know, today is that there's this duality between the inner space and outer space exploration of what it means to be human. And mm -hmm. in my opinion, uh, space has got to be part of that conversation. We have to explore. We have to be curious. I think escapism is also part of that. Um, you can't just, you know, tunnel down into your dig digital networks and not go out exploring. At some point, I think as we, you know, change our DNA, as we bring in artificial intelligence mechanisms, we're going to want to go out and find answers. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really, you know, that's kind of well, the crux also of the as podcast. the urgency speeds up. I mean, so Jane did her five minutes in the future this morning about and she did the simulation about so what do you do when you're told that like your your hometown is not going to be livable or where you this town or city where you currently live due to climate and i don't know if you saw in the chat but there were a couple of people who said all right folks like i have always ignored comments about time to go explore mars but yes. right i mean really this like it's a valid it's a valid comment about um making sure our species survives absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's bring um, all of you onto the screen here a little bit, uh, not a little bit, for, for real here. And um, just, I, I, actually, we already have our first question. So you guys are clearly engaging the audience here. So um, Paola, why don't you start here about when was the foresight presented as an opportunity to people and how was it initially received and did they buy into it right away? You want to share some of your experiences? Yes. Uh, actually, I remember that my introduction was like, 
let's be open-minded because I think that people from, from the government, they were waiting for a, a list of actions. You have to do A, B, C, and D, and voila, you have now whatever you want. And this was pretty much like, let's just understand the whole concept. So I, I say it's a process. Um, at the moment we presented, we have uh, one of the vice minister of education telling us like, oh my God, I have always created a product for people within the K-12 uh, K system, but I forgot people who have a uh, dropout that maybe now they are 40 years old, 50 years old, and I have nothing to offer to them. And, and that realization was actually really good because now there are a lot of things going on to make sure that we work on, on the dropout percentage that we have because that's people impacting the, the informal uh, system and of course the unemployed uh, population we have. Uh, I say that they buy, of course, uh, the, the information, they get it. It takes some time for people in the government to really process the information. So it's important, I will say that you also keep um, motivating and you keep using that information as part of all the interactions that you have with them. When you're, we were, what we did was so like, every time we were going to present a new project, we made a reference to, do you remember that we do have three transformation zones? So there was one for people, elderly people. So this is what we are doing. And I think that uh, now, like after pretty much six months, seven months, they, they took the information. Uh, when we did the workshops, we even uh, met with the unions. I mean, people that they, they don't love, they are not fan of the work we do. They think uh, we only work for the private sector, that we are not generating job opportunities for the whole Costa Rica population. And having them being part of our discussions, understanding the report, at least they get to understand and share the vision. We have different opinions, but at the end of the day, the objective and the main goal uh, will remain the same. So I think that um, it's a never ending process. I think mm -hmm. that uh, it's mm -hmm. just part of the culture because you are changing a mindset. You are changing the way of uh, how you do things and that takes time. Right, yeah, and what I'm hearing from you too is that you have this consistency, this drumbeat over and over again. <clears throat> I think it's easy for a team that produces foresight to say, wow, that was really cool and new, but they've been thinking about it for six months or a year. And so the report comes out and you spend a month or two talking about it and then you let it fade away. Uh, and for you to talk about this continuously returning, refreshing, um, even bringing the skeptics in and saying, all right, folks, these are our transformation zones. Let's come on board here. Uh, yeah. Kara, do you have any thoughts about, you know, sponsors, stakeholders, what they, how they're oh, yes. to the perceived <laughs> value of words like, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll come at it from, again, you know, which is kind of reverberating that, you know, I, I'm in a very highly technical background of stakeholders who, you know, especially um, with our internal discussions, were highly, highly skeptical when we first brought this concept. And it sounded very, um, you know, airy-fairy, not quantitative. And I think almost on a weekly basis, I quote Jim Daters, there's no future facts, mm -hmm. um, constantly, because it's that, you know, that constant tension between wanting to forecast and lock down everything from an analytical basis. Um, and, and then, you know, just totally submitting yourself to the fact that we're in highly uncertain environments, and we have to think about a range of possible futures. And I think, I, you know, the, the silver lining of, of the pandemic is, is I, they can't deny it, right? I mean, we are we are in a place where, you know, even if it was on somebody's radar, we didn't necessarily predict how it would happen and how it would unfold. Mm -hmm. um, but we certainly would be a lot more robust if we had, and, and moving forward as well, think about how we can be resilient across multiple futures. Yeah, yeah you know, in July, I was saying that um, basically we're all futurists now because in July, we didn't know what we were, are we, are we taking summer vacations? Are our kids going back to physical school? When are we going back to our offices? And really everyone around the world had to grasp, grapple with multiple possible futures. Now those are much shorter terms, of course, mm -hmm. um, that you know people had to think about, but just the idea to be comfortable with uncertainty and that there was this resilience of thinking through multiple possible you know, paths and building through that, um, I think really, you know, 
helped everybody in the world hopefully get a little bit better about thinking about foresight and such. Mm -hmm. Paula, there's actually a question in the chat here for you about like anything unique about the Latin American region. Like, do you think that it's uh, foresight is thought of differently, or you know, maybe you think you have some advantages in a country of five million? Um, I admire the fact that I mean you've met with you know half a dozen or more ministers of your government, and I love the story of um, the six-year-old who actually gets to meet the president. I mean, again, right, uh, and sit there and say, okay, well, I need to learn something new in school. Yeah, so I think that uh, for Latin America, there are things that, that we have to consider, and usually the governments in the region will think that all the practices uh, that we have to look for are outside the, the region. And sometimes we spend a lot of time looking for initiative in, in Finland, in New Zealand, and those type of countries, like, again, when you compare us, it's not apple to apples. It will never be, but again, cultural-wise, we need to make sure that Latin America sells ourselves as, as one region. Uh, when you see like those things are happening, for example, in education in, in Finland, they are amazing, but the way the political system works, the regulatory, there are many things that are not even close to what we face uh, in the in the countries in Latin America. So that's a challenge because for, for people in the government, if you want them again to make decisions on, on public policy, on allocation of budget, if the example or if what you are bringing, it doesn't come for these wild countries, uh, they will react as, okay, we have to try. Let's see how it goes. It's not like, yes, immediately. So I, I will say that that's a challenge in, in the region. However, at the same time, I think that having uh, the possibility of uh, guiding the governments and, and the decision makers on, we can use our same uh, own country. We don't have to look for uh, comparisons. We don't have to see ourselves as any other country because we are not. I mean, the population we have, the demographics we have, the unemployment we have, it's way too different. Of course, uh, the reason behind it might be similar, but then again, uh, by saying, let's work on internet, let's work on technology, that's not our reality. Well, we have- a Costa Rica just has so many unique assets. I mean, I think that was one of the advantages to really honing in the foresight. Um, things like one of the world's blue zones is there where yes. people not only live long, but they live long and active and healthy lives um, and continue working, right? And continue learning. Or of course, you know, we all know that Costa Rica is like 0.1% of the world's land mass, but holds something like four or 5% of the world's yes. biodiversity. So, um, Paula, I want to hear from you a little bit of some of the specific things that you did um, to change the way you brought foresight out into the world. Uh, Cindy, I, I thought of two sort of bottom up examples or that came out of our conversations that uh, Cindy did that you've never done before. And I'll see if you can are thinking of the same ones I'm thinking of. What are the yes, so <laughs> really uh, fun. I think we will be on the same page. Uh, for sure, the fact, again, CINDE is uh, the organization locally that brings the multinational sector to Costa Rica. So for the whole country, we're the ones bringing uh, the private sector, we're the ones job providing help to the private sector. So we work with very specific media um, uh, teams. We work with very specific um, communication agencies because again, our target public is the high level people, the decision makers, the CEOs, and those type of things. When we start to work on this, um, having to change people on the unemployment rate to say, I wanna do something else, I wanna do something different. It's people that they are part of areas where we don't have companies, for example, we are pretty much located uh, on the capital physically. And we we went to, to the nicest place in Costa Rica, to the beach, to the coast area. And the newspaper that someone there will read, it's not, of course, the one that is financial. Uh, it's They will read the one that is around gossip. And mm -hmm. having or asking my board members to say, hey, I have to have a, a one page announcement on this uh, specific newspaper, was like, we don't do that. We yeah. have to. Gossip newspaper, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And the, you did some new things in social media too, right? Yes, we did it for social media. Again, Cindy has just used like uh, LinkedIn and that's it. Now we have a podcast, we have a YouTube channel, we have um, 
a, a newsletter, we have a campaign with influencers. And <laughs> again, uh, what, what, what <laughs> now are called influencers, but it's people that they get to different uh, target publics. They get uh, to different people and we are training them. We are educating them on how to position the education conversation. So everything is new for us. Uh, but again, if uh, me being someone from Cinde will go to uh, Punta Arenas, which is a, a close area and talk about skills and education in the future, they won't listen to me, but we do have uh, one specific influencer locally that he's a, a, a fisherman and he is not an influencer as, as the one we know, but in Punta Arenas, he has the most uh, Punta Arenas followers. So for us, that's an influencer. And that's someone that, that we wanna really understand what's going on in the country because he's someone people will look for an opinion and he will, they will look at uh, him for, to make a decision. And that's how we have like activating all these, those different areas. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I just, because this is actually one of my favorite Zoom backgrounds. If you're an ICS <laughs> colleague, you've seen this a lot. This is a photograph of the tuna fish aisle in the supermarket in Costa Rica. I took in January back when we were still uh, able to fly. So Punta Arenas is like the tuna fish canning capital uh, yes. of Costa Rica and, and a lot of the Pacific coast. And so the idea for you to be involved <laughs> with them. So I loved hearing from you, Paola, this sort of bottom up um, you know, ways that you are trying to bring foresight in this, into making the country, you know, valuable to be in debt for investment and such. Kara, um, is there, you had a great phrase about the reality you surrender to. Um, and uh, you want to talk a little bit about how making foresight actionable and urgent to people. Uh, what are some of the best things you've done, but also what's that reality? Yeah, well, I think it's it's really hard, um, especially in space, because um, you know a lot of the capability that we develop still takes ten or fifteen years. So urgent is really difficult <laughs> in our industry. Um, I think what's really fascinating about where we kind of are is that we're really on the cusp of quite an explosion of potential activity, and I say potential because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of vulnerability, I think, between uh, some of the economics and the commercial sector and some of the things happening um, in, in, in testing in space with um, uh, different military activities. But we could be potentially on the cusp, I think, of a, a really major space renaissance. And some of the groundwork that we literally will be laying in the next one to five years could determine how the next 10, 20, 50 years look, which is really hard to grapple with. Um, one of the things that I do have um, working for me with our, you know, kind of, um, you know, status quo uh, aspect of our industry is that we have to think in 10, 15 year timeframes because that's how long it takes really to deliver capability. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, you know, it, it's, it's a tension between trying to get, you know, policymakers thinking how to change their kind of stack, you know, they usually come in with a fixed set of assumptions for a 10 to 15 year lifetime of bringing, bringing capability and architectures. And then of course you have the commercial sector uh, like, you know, like everywhere else where they're thinking on quarterly returns. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a big issue trying to rectify those two organizations and, and groups of people as we're trying to build up an enterprise that's sustainable and, and, and that really is making very fast incremental change for the better, but with the long view in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me jump to a space question here. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the builds here. So one of the things that we talked about, I would love to hear people to answer this in the chat, is that you had to provoke people with new questions about this, about space because you were dealing, Kara, with an audience that was really heads down on their particular little part of space and what they were using it for and what they needed it for. Um, and one of the goals you tried to do with the map was to get people to um, broaden their views of like the possible futures in space. So we actually set up here, and, and someone's asked this in the chat already for us, something similar here. So what are the kinds of new space possibilities that um, you had to bring to space executives? We have an, ex an example here. And people, if you'll pet, um, you know, type into the chat any ideas you have for Kara, we'd appreciate it. So you want to tell us about this one? Yeah, so um, I guess, we again, you know, when we took a step back to start the project, we were like, we really want to look at the future, not through a lens of a particular stakeholder or interest area. We wanted to really objectively look at it from a horizon scanning perspective. And that was really freeing. 
Um, and so you'll see if you go to our map, you know, our seven key themes aren't around any one stakeholder. Um, you won't, you know, we don't necessarily mention technology as, as, you know, it's a singular thing because it really is everywhere. Rather, we're looking at what motivates growth and development in space. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the particular examples, I'm sure many of you are aware, the United States just recently stood up uh, the, the, the Space Force. And one of the things that we're really noticing is, is that they're coming in with the mentality of basically looking from, you know, Earth orbit down on Earth. They're not considering all of the other activities that are happening as we look out. And so that was just, you know, one of the insights that we had had. Um, but we would love, you know, for you guys, you know, especially take a look at our map over, you know, your free time, feel free to ping me. Um, what are things that we're not thinking about? Um, mm -hmm. And how do we collectively bring that community together uh, to really pave that future today that we want in the future? So, um, yeah, we would love your ideas. And space is always fun to kind of pontificate about anyway. <laughs> and I had never thought of this before, space search and rescue, right? So what happens yeah. if some individuals um, decide that they want to go up into space and they're stranded out there? They get stranded. Go yeah. out. Is it your nation? Um, you know, rogue things. I remember years ago when I first joined the Institute, we were using a signal about, I think it was a Mexican drug cartel that paid the Venezuelans in cash to put a satellite up. And rather than their cell phones being tapped, they had their own satellite phone network. I mean, I thought it was a brilliant workaround um, mm -hmm. that involved uh, space and such. So yeah, that what are, who's gonna police out there? Those kinds of things. We, you know, have questions about uh, what's the uh, similarities between what what will space colonies inform underwater colony living mm -hmm. and vice versa, for instance. Uh, I can't even imagine all the challenges related to space debris. I don't know, Kara, if you guys, do you go into that in your map? I'm trying to remember. Um, absolutely, we go into it. And I would say we have expert, world-class experts at our company that, I mean, that to me is one of the fundamental, you know, foresight questions, enduring questions. And it's, very similar to what we're seeing with climate change. You know, they're enduring high impact things, but they happen incrementally over time. And the incentives just aren't there. You know, the small startup companies that are just looking to put CubeSats up for six months at a time, but they could stay on orbit for 20 years. Um, they don't have the money to try to put on different mechanisms to bring it back down to earth. And so I think we need to look at different plans and incentives. And of course, like everything, you know, things are gonna have to get bad, I think, unfortunately, before they, they get better. Of course, we can use scenarios and, and narratives and provoke, you know, kind of provoke thinking about this. Um, but that is a clear example of some, something that we have to fix in policymaking right now to see lasting change here in the next 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, and uh, both of you have referred to money as one of the drivers in this. Um, so Paula, what are some of the reasons that you think uh, you were able in six or seven months to inf in, uh, influence a national government budget I, I, before COVID came along? How did you already, what do you think were the tipping points? Uh, I think that one was pretty, pretty much like, we got the opportunity to meet with everyone. I mean, like all the sectors, we had a representation of, of the users, uh, the unions, people that are the detractors of what we do. So it was like a product, uh, we already did like a validation of, of the product, of the projects, of the concept. And that was something that usually uh, in our government, if uh, they want to fix something, they will give like the same bill to everyone. And again, in Costa Rica, even though we're quite a small country, we have a lot of uh, diversity in the, in the profiles on the needs people people will have. So I think that that was one of the things that uh, was a, a very good point. And the other one is we presented projects that didn't uh, request or ask the government to bring someone else to say let's have him we have to met, meet now with uh, someone from other countries or look for initiative in other countries we were able to transform the projects that we we had even the ones that we were leading as part of that the initiative that we were with the government we have to to make changes on the way that the projects were presented and ask them about instead of keep working about how do we get people to be bilingual and 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 know about customer service and those type of things Let's just get concerned about uh, the green uh, uh, future storytellers. And when we think on that, it's pretty much people in the tourism sector. Costa Rica is, is a place where people will come. It's one of our uh, major economical activities. And it's part of the whole reactivation economy. So 
proposing to them new ways of, uh, of creating jobs and creating jobs based on skills. And of course, based on the opportunities that we have as a country, I think those were like the key uh, decisions they made. Uh, we proved like we have done this for 10, 20, 30 years and the result keeps uh, being the same. There's an opportunity for us now to do things differently. We have a, rep a report that now we see as, as our tool to really understand someone else so that someone uh, have tell us that that's an opportunity, we can take this uh, to the next stage. Uh, the next stage. And I think that again, for, for the government, uh, it's, it's a very critical government right now for us um, because of, of the whole situation in terms of uh, what it means for Costa Rica in terms of political. So they were the ones saying, if there is a government that has to change things, it's the one that is right now. So they yeah. took <laughs> like like that, it's like, so okay, based on that, it was good for us. us. There's a government that needs to change. It's the one that's in power right now. I mean, and for yeah. you all to be bold enough to get out and say that, I mean, I really compliment you on doing that. Um, I think it was probably nice for you all to have brought in the Institute as a third party thinking partner about these possible futures. I mean, obviously Costa Rica was deeply involved and you know, we visited universities and, and all kinds of groups. Um, and, uh, but I, I absolutely to get to that point and say, you know, hello, this is where it has to be. And of course in Costa Rica, presidents can't be reelected. Um, and uh, which is a blessing and a curse because yeah. uh, they only have five years to, to make a change, but they're not worried about getting reelected and, and hopefully building uh, into the next future there. Uh, Cara, and, and he, uh, by the way, I want to point out that you all do have one thing in common, which is that Costa Rica has a well-known astronaut, Franklin Chang. Yes. Um, and and uh, I think he's working now on sort of the biosphere. But uh, Cara, do you have any thoughts that you want to share with us or questions you wanted to ask Paula? Um, well, I could, oh, go ahead, Paula, go ahead. No, no, go, 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 don't worry. No, go. I just wanted to draw, you know, you had mentioned, uh, you know, finances and money being so critically important. And that was another just finding from, you know, our, our futures map and an adventure kind of thinking about the future of space. And that really was that foundationally, you know, we collectively, the, the commercial sector, the private sector, everyday citizens need to figure out how to make space sustainable. And there's a lot of avenues to get there. And, and you can kind of think back to, you know, before we had air traffic control, before we had the aerospace industry, before we had roadways, right? There were government functions. And then of course, commercial functions, industrial functions that had to make that all happen and thrive. And there's not a whole lot of discussion that's really happening right now. And I think there's a lot of similarities um, when you're trying to, you know, make change within your own governments is, is it all starts at, a collaborative effort, right? That happens where you're bringing in the money, you're bringing in the innovation, but you have to have the right policies that that are, you know, as, as we always say, anticipatory policymaking is really essential, right? For these things to happen. If you don't have that as a backplane, the, the rest is gonna fall out. Yeah, yeah. And I think you and I have had a discussion about how senior executives, they want a solution in an hour. They wanna come into a workshop uh, I see both of you nodding your heads there, right? Uh, so uh, to, to frame, I think, the expectations of what people can have, to give them that long-term timeframes, uh, to understand the time frame. I mean, I've heard from both of you, understand the time frame from which people make their decisions, to frame it that way, um, but at the same time, sort of add that action of how can we do things now. Kara, can you talk a little bit about how much it took, how much effort it took for you to develop an internal group ready to do foresight? Sure. Yeah. Well, I can talk about it at, at two levels. I think one is, you know, the the immediate core which we're developing to kind of meet those three pillars that I had talked about in our earlier session. And and really, um, you know, right now the way we've managed it because we are still growing. We're in our third year of the initiative. Um, we're still working on getting full traction and buy-in and, and, and having us become an integral part of the DNA of the organization. That is, in, in my mind, a five to seven year journey uh, to get the kind of traction that we need and we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're a small group. There's, there's, there's about two of us that really do this full time, um, but we have about 30 people that support us at varying levels. And I think, again, you know, I had mentioned it's important to have a network because you can't do everything yourself. Um, and, and, you know, obviously having a diverse set of perspectives is only going to enrich your studies. Um, so, and, and, and I've seen everything from, you know, a, a tenth of a person's support all the way up to, you know, 10 people or 50 people 
supporting futures oriented activities depending on the organization and and you do what you do what you can with what you got and mm -hmm. and you keep working on towards what you think you need to have and and, and buying out those resources mm -hmm. um and then in terms of time just just to give people you know a general perspective on time for a project it took us about nine months you know from start to finish to make that map and i will say another thing and institute for the future is really good about doing this is especially if you want to have some sort of artistic or visual communication mm -hmm. of your findings have the artist in the room with you from day one oh, nice. it was a success because we were working hand in hand with them along the way um, and i think that's so important and and that goes back to bringing in a diverse team um mm -hmm. and and yeah again you know you're probably never going to get the resources that you need to fully you know go through every little activity you think it's going to make necessary but you can do a lot with just a little bit mm -hmm. uh, so that's just recommendations i would make is mm -hmm. you know figure out what your priorities are and, and work with what you got mm -hmm. we have a question for either of you both of you about having to reposition your message with the same audience uh so kara you've just been trying to reposition futures as important to the whole space enterprise um paula you've had to go back to the same ministers over and over again the same universities and union leaders uh, do you find that it's tell us tips and tricks there do you use the exact same while well, we start power do you use the exact same approach each time do you show them the same slides do you tell them a different story bring a different person what are the ways that you might bring it back to them yes for us well i think that number one is is involving other people within the governments because something important that we were just mentioning about the government is it doesn't matter if it is the president or, or the minister they don't remain in the government, they, they will change every four years. Mm -hmm. But the people, the directors, the, the people that execute the work, they are the ones that will remain in the government. And they are the ones that can either help you to, to advance in one specific initiative, or they are the ones that will stop you and won't make anything happen. So for us, uh, what has been changing is, is the approach of the target audience that we have. It's of course uh, the same conversation maybe with the Minister of Education, but it is a different one with uh, the principals for the directors, the teachers, the students. Uh, we keep using um, the same, but the approach, the way we present. Now we have more uh, Costa Rican examples because of course that uh, we got the report, which was amazing for us. We uh, eye-opening for us, but then again, we have to really understand the, pro that the whole uh, report and, and, and try to test. There were new things for us being the, the investment promotion agency. So we have to go back, read the report. In my case, I know the report. I, I can tell like so, yeah. every single word on the report because I, I read that every single day. Uh, but uh, meaning the, the, the ministers, the government, but for us, where we really change, sometimes we talk about the report, not telling people there's a report. Uh, when we do the podcast, when we do the social media, when we work with the influencers, they will have, I mean, it's not the language you will use with them to talk about foresight. And, and so we have these three transformation zones. Yeah. We tell them uh, we have uh, the, the group of green uh, influencers, they are the ones that they go and visit Costa Rica and they uh, reinforce that the tourism in Costa Rica, the local one, and we just talk the language they talk and the way we present is, so how can you uh, keep creating jobs on this area? How, what are the things that you think we have to do? What are the green skills? How can you start that conversation so people care about the country and, and, and the nature? So I think that uh, every, every, every time will be different. Because again, you even get expert on on the report and, and the way you have to present, and and for us, what has been amazing is just that you can adapt the information like so many times Maybe that you will get that. to to different groups. Yeah, even gossip newspapers. Um, yes, here in New York, we have page six in, in uh, the New York Post. So uh, that's and that, so I, you know I hear you, Paul. I hear the idea that uh, that maybe you don't even refer necessarily to report. Kara, I hope you're taking notes because you're about to dive into this same stage, right? Uh, yeah. To bring different people's perspectives, to bring different viewpoints in there. Um, always, right? Find your find your person who's already bought on board and bring them with you. Uh, so, but these are these have been really helpful here. I'd love to hear from each of you, maybe like a little tweet like um, summary of what advice if you were trying to make foresight urgent and you don't have the power right when you're influencing without power uh kara i'm going to ask you to come up first but when you're thinking about this 
and um, and all the lessons that you've done and, and your sort of action plan as you move forward. What are you thinking about a good advice for driving urgency from foresight? Yeah, I guess I would say definitely messages are more effective when they're repeated. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in, in doing it in different ways, doing it in different medium. I mean, we've done videos, we've done brochures, we've done one-on-one -on -one meetings. We've tried to influence the people that, you know, and, and get to the people that we know our senior decision makers really count on and trust. And if you can get in that way. Um, so I think do the best you can. And it, it may feel daunting because you're constantly having to say the same thing in different ways. Um, but over time, that really is going to pay out. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And Paula, advice? Yeah, I will say that uh, keep investing the time on, on really understanding your uh, audiences. Uh, they are so different the way they get the information. is It's so different the way you convey the message. Uh, and most important, I think that when you don't have the final decision, when, when you are not the high decision maker, what you share is, is the passion, is the objective, is the mission of, of someone else. And I think that you have to talk from that. I mean, I'm not an educator, but I'm passionate about education. I'm passionate about making sure that Costa Rica keeps developing the skills. And that has to be the language we talk with them, because again, you are going to tell someone uh, it's a good idea to do this, not being the one in charge of the final decision. Right, yes. Well, I want to congratulate you both. Paula, your passion really has come through with all the creative ways that you have gotten this foresight out into the country with, you know, newspapers and ministers and, and employers and fishermen in Punta Arenas and uh, social media influencers and podcasts. And Kara, uh, I congratulate you on how far your passion has taken you so far to get this uh, group started within your organization to produce this first map. We'd love to have you back at some point uh, at the Institute for to go a little more deeply into the future of space. There were some questions that popped up in the chat we couldn't get to. But uh, I want to also just remind our audience that, uh, first of all, you can email me. Let me get past these slides here. Um, you can email me, Daria Lam, if you have any questions or ideas or want some other to talk more about this. But also, both of these women came to us through connections through Foresight Essentials. Paolo's boss was one of the very early people to attend IFTF's Foresight Essentials in the first year we offered that training. Kara, not so, you know, fairly recently. There are two classes that have spaces. Uh, if you want to learn more, please dive into that. And uh, I wish you both a great deal of luck uh, as you move forward. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello, it's me, Dylan. I'm back here with Angela, the virtual person who's helping me co-host today. Angela, you know, being a human is really hard. Are there any topics that virtual beings are uncomfortable talking about? Military applications for AI is a touchy subject. Oh. Are, are you worried about that? Definitely. Okay. All right. Well, I guess that's what it is. We will be right back after this.